Let's see. Let's look. Okay. Um. There's an ad going on, so I can't even see. All right. It's the. It begins. Uh, welcome to PS. Um, the first stream. Um, PS is short for the programming stream, where uh, we'll just gather on nearly every day except Sundays and uh, just write some software together. Um, so I started this mainly because I enjoy writing software. That's, that's the gist of it. But I also, the part of software that I enjoy writing the most is working with other people. But um, uh, I can, uh, classes do give that um, at school right now. Uh, but I also wanted to get work on my own projects, but still have that collaborative nature with other pe uh, with other people. So that's why I started PS. Um, I also started PS because there are a lot of um, streamers that already do programming, but there aren't a lot of. They tend to do a lot of um, uh, game development stuff, and I wanted to introduce more systems programming, so like uh, operating systems and compilers and stuff like that. Uh, Peter Sleepy said, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. It's really cold outside, but, you know, we're going to, I'm warm in my own home, thankful for it too. So, yeah, I'm pretty good. Hopefully you're doing well too. Um, yeah, so the, so that's kind of why I started uh, PS. Um, so content-wise, uh, I will be I will be programming right so I will open you know terminal Emacs and all that jazz and I'll write the code but a lot of the designing that we'll do before we even write the code and while we're writing the code I will keep an eye out on the uh, twitch chat stream hi Chris <laughs> um, we'll also um, another thing is for each project, uh, we'll have a some sort of design doc, and on the Twitch homepage towards the bottom, you'll see a link to it, and you can click on that uh, to this design doc. So I'll go, I'll go to Twitch here. If you scroll down to this about section, you'll see I added a, the first document is a stream log. So here. Um, before, at the beginning of each work session, or each programming session, we'll define a clear set of um, objectives and key results we want at the end of it. So the objective is kind of the goal we're trying to reach, and the key results or deliverables will deliver. And I'll have a stream of questions here so that in case someone joins in later, they can just go to the bottom of this list of questions and they'll know what are we currently investigating. And the other thing, and anyone can comment on it, say, hey, let's work on uh, this, or you can add this feature, uh, deliver this instead, it's more reasonable, etc. Uh, another thing is this design doc here. Every project will have a design doc, and anyone can come in and contribute what they want. They can uh, suggest things, they can comment design changes, interface changes, whatever. Um, the point is, uh, I'm not the smartest person and I would very much appreciate you bringing your intelligence to me and then we can, you know, form a melting pot of the knowledge we both have and produce something pretty cool. Yeah. That's kind of the gist of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so the first thing we're going to work on, this, so the first thing we're going to work on is regular expressions. Now, I know some people are, might be uh, scared of it, confused by it or they have absolutely no idea what it is so I'll, I'll introduce that and everything but later on um, my hope is that everyone who's watching will submit on the form so on the page here there's a Q&A and feed feedback Google form here so hopefully you'll go there and submit topics you'd want me to cover and then I'll and then I'll create projects to reflect that and I'll contact and hopefully you'll add your email to it so I can contact you and we can have a back and forth on uh, the direction you want PS to go, yeah. So, so just for the first project, we're going to do something a bit confusing, which is regular expressions. So, uh, a regular expression allows you, uh, a computer programmer, 
to define a small expression that will expand to reflect a whole uh, set of things. Uh, let me let me show you an example. So I'll go into I'll just make a folder um, called Regex has Uh, I'll touch a whole bunch of files. Okay. So now this folder contains um, three files. They're just differently named. But say I wanted to do something to just the CPP files, right? I, normally I can just you know list them out. But when the folder ends up being super large, um, that can be annoying to list out all of them. And that's where regular expressions are super useful. Uh, I'll give an example. So say I wanted to remove anything that ended with a CPP, right? I know I just want to work with this a.c. The way I would do that is rm to remove star dot cpp, right? This way, this a, the a and b will match this star and end with dot cpp. The .cpp will expand to reflect anything that matches, uh, that ends with .cpp. So if I do this, you'll see that those two files are gone. Now that's a super useful thing to use in nearly, I can't think of a context where, okay, let me rephrase that. Um, it's super useful here, obviously. Another place where it would be useful is any form of uh, string matching. So say you have this huge string that you're trying to parse, um, and you're, by parse I mean you're trying to like break it down for the useful information inside, like you're trying to find a substring that uh, matches this criteria, but the programming of those criteria can be super complicated, um, right? Like it must begin with an angle bracket, it must end with a slash angle bracket, for example. Um, what regular expressions are great at is it simplifies that the defining of the rule to a single string that you can use. So for example, um, instead of programmatically saying uh, for any, any character in a string, if it matches with a dot and followed by a CPP, return that. Instead, we can just have a regular expression that does the matching of dot CPP. It'll capture that output and it'll make use of it. Yeah. So that's where regular expressions are useful. Um, regular expressions are also useful for compilers, which is essentially how most of most of the fun, funda most fundamental computer programs are compiled programs. Uh, most servers are written in C, which is a compiled program, and all compilers make use of uh, an initial stage called lexical analysis. Lexical analysis takes um, some document and it will break it down into individual what are called tokens. And it will use different delimiters, which are things that separate tokens from each other. So for English, uh, a tokenizer will take this, it will split this up into RE3, will, be, a, regular, etc. Um, so that's where regular expressions are super useful. You can use a tool like uh, Flex or Lex to build your own lexical analyzer. And that's usually the first stage in a compiler. It's pretty useful. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so for the first the first project of PS, we're gonna work on a regular expression library. So the you'll see the design doc here says that the RE3 will be a regular expression library that aims to be fast. Now fast is I know a bit arbitrary, but our key benchmark will be the RE2 library published by uh, Google, which I I will admit, I highly doubt I can beat them. They're very, they're obviously very smart people, but we're going to try anyway. Um, we're also going to, we're going to aim to have this regular expression library. It'll be written in C and C++, and it should work on both Windows and Linux. Uh, I use both, and I want to use it in both, so. And if you wanted to have, uh, have uh, Mac support, just like let me know. Um, I also wanted to work with any programming language. So the underlying engine that processes the regular expression will be written in C and C++, but will have, will provide hopefully an API that will allow other programming languages to use 
um, RA3 to generate regular expressions and use them. And I believe, and it should support a UTF-8 char set. UTF-8 is different from, uh, actually, I'll, I'll, we'll have a little history lesson here. So in the 1970s is when ASCII became the standard form uh, for for uh, for representing characters. So like every uh, a bunch a bunch of integers essentially represents a character. Um, so for example, actually I'll show the ASCII table. I don't remember any of these. Top of my head. Yeah. So here, for instance, uh, the integer representation of forty five represents a, a dash. For one hundred and three repres one hundred and three represents a G. That's ASCII. But ASCII obviously doesn't really do well past that point, right? You get, okay, fine, extended ASCII, but it doesn't support um, East Asian uh, languages, for instance. It doesn't support South Asian languages. Actually, it doesn't support most of the languages, to be honest. Um, and that's where UTF-8 was. UTF-8 came in roughly, it was created by Rob Pike and I believe Richard Stallman, and they created it to be backwards compatible to... Um, to ASCII, secure, portable, and they wanted it to be able to represent a lot, a lot of characters. So there's UTF-8, there's UTF-16, UTF-32-bit, and they all can represent a lot of characters, a lot more than what ASCII can. And this way, uh, our regular expression library will work with non-English languages, hopefully. That's the goal. Um, an example of how we would use it is we would define a regular expression and pass construct an RE3 object out of it. And then we can use that object to create a match for some string that we want to read. Um, so I'll actually, I'll go through this example here. Uh, what is this regular expression here? So we are looking at a caret, hello, a dollar sign. So the caret and dollar sign both are anchor points. An anchor point is essentially saying, oh yeah, this is essentially, this line essentially says that the phrase hello must be at the beginning of the line, and the end of the, by the end of the line, you should only be reading the characters for hello, right? In a single line, only hello should appear. That's essentially what this is saying. The caret says that the hello must begin at the beginning of the line, this dollar sign says the end of the line should end with that O. It's kind of what it is. Um, we'll go a little bit more in depth into supporting a more robust set of uh, regular expressions. We'll probably follow the Perl syntax. So if we wanted to change this, we could say we wanted to match the, if we did this instead, this star represents, I believe, any character, like any individual character. So we can or no character at all, too. So this could be hell, could be hella, hell b, hell c, all the way, it could also be hell one, hell two, hell three. That's what this star represents. We'll just, this is just for an example. It's kind of what the C++ example would be, too. Right. Um, so ideally, uh, for this regular expression library, we'll have it well, we should allow for the ability to pre-compile and reuse it. And what I mean by that is, um, at the beginning of your C++ binary, you should be able to construct a set of regular expressions and reuse those set of regular expressions, right? The alternative would be um, constructing a regular expression inside um, whenever you want to use it, right? But that's not too efficient because every regular expression is a lot of um, it actually is a mini compilation uh, whenever you construct it. So it will take a string and compile it into a table at the end, right? So we don't want to repeat that computation. Instead, what we'll do is we'll give them, give the user, the uh, user of the library, the ability to pre-compile them at the beginning of the file, essentially like this, and let them use that regular expression object later. But in the case where they just wanted to use it once, they should be able to also compile a regular expression on the spot and use it once and then move on, because you don't need to pre-compile in that case. Um, we should support um, extract uh, matching substrings. So if you have a large string, right, and you have some regular expression, that large string should do it, could be 
fully matched to that regular expression. Um, that means that, say you have some string, like say we're doing this regular expression, right? Do this right next. And we have some string, like, uh, hello, my, actually, let's start this. Hello, my name is. This will not match this regular expression because it fails to meet this last anchor point, which is that, that there should be an end line here. But that's clearly not the case. There's a space of my name is Sam, etc. That would be a failure of a full match. Right? So this should output false. Something like this. Yeah. Oh, that's a... Oh, sorry, that's not related to that. This is more related to the next point, fully mastering. What this is about is we should be able to capture whenever a regular expression gets matched. So for instance, um, so with Perl, you can define, there are these things called world, uh, word classes in regular expressions, which essentially we can define like this, and this means if you ever match a word, uh, return it. So if we have some regex for, um, let's say, words at the end of a line, right? This N represents uh, a new line, which means it's at the end, and we want to capture all the words at the end of the line, what extract matching substring means is we should not only return true, but we should also return the word that got matched, right? So for example, if we had a string here, um, hello my friend, it should match, it should return true and also return friend in this case, yeah. We should also support uh, partial matching, this is like a lighter version of fully matching, which is here we have this string, right? So we want to, what partial matching will do is you'll have a list or a single regular expression that you want to match, and if that regular expression or any of the regular expressions uh, match the match the string, uh, then you return that. So here it would return true because it contains the word hello. Actually, let's make that. This wouldn't actually work because of this end line. But if we do this, where it just says the beginning of this line should have a hello, it will match that. It will output true. And the last feature I want to make sure we have is incremental scanning. So it says it here you can read the string up to a full or partial match and essentially put the regular expression in a while loop. Um, so here, instead of while cn uh, gets, gets passed in a string, instead it'll do while regex can be fully matched to that string. Go here, change this. And then in this case, we'll do so. And then in the case where the, um, the string doesn't match, uh, it will just return. It will just exit that while. It's kind of that's kind of the gist of it. Um, obviously, this interface is very clearly not fleshed out, but um, we can. We'll slowly start sorting out the details over the next few hours, hopefully. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I kind of wanted to spend this time now to go over some of the theory of regular expressions, just so it makes a little bit more sense on how we would implement them. So normally regular expressions, I guess I'll just make a theory section here. Yeah, so regular expression, if we wanted, so I mentioned before that a regular expression inside of a program will be a mini compilation. Now what I mean by that is that when you, whenever you construct a regular expression, uh, the underlying implementation of that regular expression is represented as a 
a, deter a deterministic finite automata. It's a lot. To bear with me. <laughs> so, a deter so I'm going to give to explain what a finite automata is. I'm going to give an example of a subway turns uh, turn tur like a turnstile. Like you swipe your metro card and you'll uh, rotate around it. So, um, so if you're in finite automata. So a finite automata is essentially, you can think of it as um, there as some kind of uh, machine, a theoretical machine, that goes through different states. So for example, if you had a subway, subway turnstile, normally it begins locked, right? You, if you try and push against the turnstile, um, it won't work. It'll block you. That's what it's, that's what it's supposed to do. And then once you scan a metro card, uh, New York, New York, New York subway uses metro card. So if, once you sub swipe your card in, then it will evaluate whether you have enough money on it or not. If you do, it'll subtract it. If you don't, it'll let you know. In the case of a failure where um, where the so where you don't have enough balance in your card, you have the state. Let's represent it as a circle for it to be locked, right? What it will do is it will not change state. It will go right back to being locked because you don't have enough money. In the case where it worked, uh, when it will subtract a bunch of your belt, and then momentarily it will be unlocked, the turnstile. In that case, you can push it, and you can go right through it. But then immediately after you leave, uh, it will detect that it turned, and then it will lock it. It will go right back to where it was before. That's kind of like the, so the idea behind the finite automata is there are a finite set of states that a, a machine can be in, and then the automata describes how you transition between them. So here, actually, I'll insert a, I'll insert a drawing. I think that might make things easier. So you'll have, you'll have an initial state for it being locked. Uh, next state for be for it being unlocked. So locked, unlocked, and then there are transitions between them. You can go that way, or you can go back. You can also loop back to yourself. Like this. Oh. So here. It, it starts off locked. In the case where it fails to get uh, enough money from your card, it'll loop back to itself, right? That's the transition. Uh, where it swipes a card, not enough money, it'll come back. In the case where it swipes a card, there is enough money, it'll swipe, and then it'll unlock. And then once the, there's never really any point where the, well, it'll go unlocked back to itself to be unlocked again, that would be pretty bad. Anyone can go through, I think, in that case. So the immediate, immediate next transition from unlocked would be if the if the turnstile turned. In that case, it'll go right back to being locked. Right. That's a simple example of a subway turnstile. That's what a finite automata is. It essentially takes a machine and describes the states and transitions between them. How do you go from one state like locked to the next? Now, a regular expression essentially gets taken and converted into this finite automaton. And in memory, in the computer, it gets represented as a table. Uh, and this table, if you want to look it up, is called a state transition table, I believe. So, so here we have, here we'll define the states. Locked, unlocked. And then here I believe we'll define the transition. Here. So if it's locked, transitions, transition back to locked. So essentially it's something like this table. Just go, just go. I have to so I have to detail it a little bit later, but um yeah, there will be a state transition diagram that, or a state transition table, which gets generated from a regular expression. Um, 
but even before that, uh, before I can go even further, I have to describe the concept of determinism. So with a deterministic finite automaton, you can essentially you can determine where it will be at any time, right? So with a deterministic finite automaton, there is only what can happen is you can be only at one place at a time, and there's only one transition between states. Now with the non-deterministic finite automata, what's possible is you have a normal deterministic finite automata, but instead of only being restricted to one state at a time, you can be in multiple states at a time. Um, and not only that, but you don't necessarily need a rule-based transition to go from state to state. Those are called epsilon transitions. So you can immediately, if there is an epsilon transition here, you can enter it being locked and immediately transition to being unlocked without reading any input. So you can be both locked and unlocked with a non-deterministic finite automaton. So obviously NFAs, which is what we'll call it, aren't really, they're not, there aren't really real world corollaries that I, I can actually think of off the top of my head. But, um, but what, a regular, what will happen with a regular expression is we'll take it, um, essentially we're going to parse it for the characters and determine like word classes, groupings of regular expressions, and we'll use that to generate a non-deterministic finite automata using Thomson's construction algorithm. So Thomson's construction algorithm was written um, by a person who actually was one of the first writers of Unix. He was part of the Bell Labs team that wrote Unix. Um, uh, Thomson, and he essentially wrote Thomson's construction algorithm to handle and make regular expressions. Uh, and what it will do is it will take a regular expression and it will generate a non-deterministic finite automata for it. But a computer only really executes one instruction at a time, simplistically, right? Um, and also, non-deterministic finite automata are pretty slow to execute. Um, also, if we were to, if we were to write a NFA executor, I think it would be pretty slow. That would be my guess. But so to handle that, we're actually going to convert the NFA into a deterministic finite automata, which is like what we're used to, right? Single transition at a time. And the reason we're going to do that is because DFAs are thought to be faster than NFAs. And so a DFA gets represented as a table, and um, yeah, so our regular expression will be converted to a table, and then we'll use that table to execute essentially regular expression matching. Um, that's kind of like the theoretical uh, overview of it. So let's just get back into this design stage, right? So that's kind of the theory. I don't think we need this. I can actually see if I can, I'll add it to you for myself to add So that's that. Um, so the different stages I think we're going to need, this is essentially the project planning stage. So I think we can define a set of milestones deliverables for those milestones and dates we want to aim for those milestones to be delivered at. So um, I'll, actually, I'll just make a table for that. So we have milestones, deliverables, date, notes. Support for the Perl syntax for regular expressions. Regular expression. 
Lexer. So we're essentially going to write a Lexer for Perl regular Perl based regular expressions. Now Perl defines things. So regular expressions are relatively simple, and what different languages will do is it will take their take a regular expression and it will expand it. So we'll add classes like we mentioned before, like slash w here. That's a word class. So and essentially any word will get matched to that. So first we want to do um, we want to do a regular expression lexer. What um, we can try and set it to be done. I think by next week, right? So have it do eighteen. Then after that, we want to um, actually let's see. Pretty sure we can probably finish it sooner. Let's set it February eighth for now. Um, then after that, we have we've under we understand the regular expression now. That we know the groups. Uh, oh, should be a lexer and parser. So a lexer will tokenize the regular expression, so it will break it up into each character so that we can process them. And then the processing, understanding of what's happening, is done by a parser. So we'll hopefully get those done by next week. Then for the week after that, we should have a regex to NFA uh, converter. We'll do a week after that. Then we can have NFA to DFA converter do the week after that. And then the key deliverables would be. So if we, by key deliverables, I mean like a program that will be able to do something. So we should be able to uh, take a regular expression. Formed list of tokens. So instead of it just being split up each character and recognize that they're by themselves, because each character is super important, right? The lex lexer part's not that uh, complicated, but having an informed uh, understanding of what the lexer is, um, or, or informed understanding of what the regular expression is, will help us later on down the road. Um, so tokens. And then for the week after, we should be able to convert a regular expression to a, a non deterministic binary automaton. So that will also, I'm pretty sure, be represented as a table. Um, but it will be a table that we likely won't be able to execute. I'm actually going to make sure that's the case. I'm, maybe it's possible, this is a crazy idea, that maybe NFAs can be as fast and can be executed. So I'm going to look into that. Uh, look into other NFA I don't want to just assume that that's not possible. Um, and then the key delivery for the last week should be to convert a regular expression into a to a DFA. So this is essentially the underlying like algorithm. These are the uh, like algorithm milestones, right? The this is this is essentially going to be us just writing a bunch of string processing. This will be a week about Thompson's construction. This will be a week about um, uh, I think it's a reduction algorithm. So like and so the algorithm to convert NFAs to DFAs is essentially the step to remove NFA features, right? So the N what makes an NFA super different from a DFA is that the NFA has epsilon transitions and you can be in multiple states at once. Now to convert that to a DFA, which can only be at one state at a time without any epsilon, epsilon transitions, what you do is you take an NFA and you essentially simulate it, right? 
So anytime there's an epsilon, uh, anytime there's an epsilon transition, you immediately treat the state that you're at and the states you can epsilon transition to as a single state. And then you determine, after that, uh, if I read any input from an alphabet, which is like any character, uh, what will happen, right? If I'm in this combined state and I transition to, I don't know, A to B to C, I'll handle, we should, you have to handle all those cases. And any time uh, a new state gets covered, you add that. And you also have to add the epsilon transitions from the new state that you are in to any other place where it gets epsilon transition to, and that becomes its own state. And that process of simulating and combining states and running the epsilon transition as if it already happened um, is how you can take an NFA, essentially deconstruct it into a much larger DFA. Yeah, so that's what this week will be about. Um, as it's possible that we could take more time or less time here, depending on if we find out that if we if it turns out that the NFA can be executed like I said before that it's possible it's slower that doesn't really make s intuitive sense to me because if you're in parallel ex in parallel execution seems faster right um, but we'll have to we'll have to investigate whether NFA execution is possible and depending on that we'll cut this week in half or not right so yeah so that will do once we have those basics down of generate of compiling of compiling or pre-compiling a regular expression, we'll have these two complete. So, so by this time, we'll need the Okay, and um, the fourth week would be the entire string. So fully matched and partially matched can be, I'm pretty sure can be done in a single day. They're both very similar. That extracting matching substring, you'd have to add that in somewhere. In this, roughly these two, these three are particularly pretty similar, I think. Um, but this extract matching substring could take a little bit more time. Incremental scanning will probably take a decent amount of time too. Scanning. Let's actually let's make sure to do. Let's make sure to do this last. Um, extracting magic substring. Let's also make sure to do this. The ends because we want to first make sure that it matches it properly. All right. Just this. These will just literally return the wings. I don't have to worry about much other than that. Extract matching substring. So here we'll do really match the partial match. Here should be the first functions besides a constructor that we would implement. Um, implementation for Set that to be due the week after. Okay. That would be my 
watch first. Ten. Extracting, extracting uh, a matching substring would just be something we change and essentially change in the interface of week three and it will return it. And incremental search would just be a question of how we handle booleans, I think. And I think other than that, I don't think we need six weeks for this. We'll just delete this column. Oh, or row, rather. go. All right. So that's, that'll be our schedule. Where can we find the Perl? I just realized when we construct the DFA, it's possible there will be a lot of redundant states. Uh, if you do a direct conversion from NFA to DFA, that's just uh, because of Thompson's construction algorithm has a lot of um, unnecessary epsilon transitions. So we probably want to spend a little bit more time on this. So the con so Thompson construction algorithm is like relatively a simple like conversion of certain regular expressions to other things so I think we can so I don't think we'll need a week or rather I think we'll need more time on this so we can bump that up I think three days of all of these are three days so this will be fourth this will be eleventh okay. this will I think this stage will probably be the hardest one Week three will be our hardest. So. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. So right now we Okay. Uh, we were able to get the design push how long will Take. Our objective today was to get started on our IC. And our IC results should be, we should have the build, build for it and set up. Alright, a simple just CMake build. Um, that, push out the design doc. I think if we get those two done, I think we should be good for our IC3. All right, so build day. Yeah, this is the grudgiest part, but it needs to be done. So another developer folder. We'll go into util. So I, the way I organize my developer folder is I have all my 
biology related products here. CSP is short for CS Prague, which is the course I'm a TA for. Experimental is exactly what it sounds like, experimental stuff. Networks is network, ne networking related uh, C code mainly. This is my site, school stuff. Lib is for algorithm work, because I consider those as libraries that you, know, you could use. And util are utility projects that I use, or that I will create. Um, yeah, and then you can see all the things I want to do that I haven't gotten to. Kind of why I started this too. This channel. So what do we need to tell? We'll make R3. Make it R3 for it. Alright. So we, so we probably want to make an includes directory. Actually, let's first let's first create a CMake file. So CMake is a so CMake is a meta build generator. It's different from a normal uh, make file or a Bazel file or anything like that because those uh, make Bazel other build tools will build your uh, targets. It'll build a um, it'll build an executable that you can run. Um, what CMake will do is it'll generate a project. It'll generate a project. So like CMake will generate a make file. It'll generate a Xcode project, um, or it will create a Microsoft video, Microsoft Visual Studio solution instead. Um, I like using CMake because I sometimes work on Windows and I can just switch between the two. And if you're ever working on an open source project that you want Windows people to be also to also contribute to, you can just add, add a CMake list file instead of just a make file, and it should be uh, more accessible to them. So we're going to do CMake's list.txt. So I'm going to create a directory for source code. We'll make one for includes. We'll make one for tests. Um, what else would we need? I'm going to keep all the documentation in the header file. I don't think we would need like a separate one. Um, or I'll keep it in includes. Hmm. We have a this. We have a CMakes list includes source test. Um, I guess we could have README, but I'll just I'll just let the GitHub repository handle that. So I'll just do a GitHub project for this. You. Since I think I will give it a permissive MIT license. Simple permissive. We can we can kind of add um, essentially like boilerplate. Uh, oh, another thing. So for tests, I'm going to use the Google test Google uh, testing uh, C++ library. I just I've used it a lot and I think it's super useful. So test here. I'm going to add this as a sub module. Pure free skill makes sense. That's yes, sad. So here, I've got the link for that. And then we can do its submodule. Why did 
that quick. So we want to update the summary for each sync. We want to add this repository into a path. So we're going to do that. So get the module, add this repository to test slash test. I'll just name it G test. And then okay, this should do it. Alright. Tests. We'll see G test is there. And we probably need to touch the C make. So this global CMakes list test will define the project as a whole. Uh, includes will just be a bunch of header files. Um, I don't think that we'll need a CMakes list target. But, um, but yeah, so the source will need one, and the test will definitely need one, because we compile source code, we compile our, uh, our tests as targets to execute. So I see um, the CMakes list file in the test folder does two things. It will define all of our test targets to run. It will define different flags we'll need for each test. So some tests will be in parallel, some we won't have in parallel. And it will also be responsible for almost like including the CMakes list file that's already inside Google Tests. So it would be essentially including this target inside our, uh, inside our project. Um, CMakes list is pretty confusing syntactically, but I think it's worth learning. And in fact, I don't think I entirely know it yet either, so I'm gonna work with that. Um, yeah. Let's see, what do we have? Yeah, I'm just gonna scond it. Oh, so I see. So uh, previously I worked on this thing called Condit. Condit is a, a status tracking object for your like for your program. So instead of instead of returning an int to represent the status, you return a status object which will carry um, a status enum and a string describing it. Uh, it was kind of a toy project to experiment with CMake and like different project structure. Like, hey, I think I'm gonna replicate that one too. Or I'm pretty sure I placed um, Google test inside there. Yeah, that's what I did. Um, hmm. So let's see. Let's do get some module help again. Let's see what we can do. I think we can, we can I'm pretty sure we can just remove. Right. Let me do this inside a third party folder. Yeah. Party. We just remove test, retest cursively. Yeah. Um, I think we can do get submodule in it. That didn't work out. Okay. So let's go back to help. What does it take? It takes a path. Oh, I think I think I just say in it. I think that would be better. Okay. So, so we're 
would open the terminal just to go into Conda and see what I did there, because I don't remember. I had to do a CMix or anything like that. Okay. I think we can just replicate that structure. So we can open a current directory in Max. CMix list. We'll open Conda CMix list. So we'll do three. So we'll set the project name to be RE3. We're explicitly defining this as a C project. Context in our content in our third party directory here. So we'll do third party. We're gonna add the library that we're going to generate here. We'll call it libre3 static. So static here will essentially generate a static library. Um, is that what we want to do? We probably want to do a So, so, what a, so the difference between a static and a shared library is with a static library, it will not only generate the object file, it will also include all the dependencies you would need for it. So for example, um, say you wanted to statically compile a string library. It's kind of a weird thing to do, but um, if you wanted to do that, you'd have to incorporate portions of the C runtime library into your lib string, essentially. And that would, what that does is it makes, I think it makes your object files more portable. It makes them faster because you don't have to do any dynamic, uh, you don't have to load or look up an object file later on. But it does make your object file larger. And what a shared library is, is instead of it compiling everything that it'll, it'll need all together, it'll instead leave placeholders. Like, um, I know these instructions to execute, um, and eventually when I need to, I will get this object file elsewhere, bring it here, and I'll execute that code, put that back, etc. That's kind of um, how, pretty sure most C++ uh, libraries use it. You know. Um, a lot of command line utilities that you use will use shared libraries instead of within the C runtime library instead of just compiling everything all together. It makes it faster. Um, it essentially reduces object code duplication, if that makes sense. So I think we're going to make this a shared library. Um, let's see how we do that though. So C makes list shared library. So we can just declare it sure, that's what I thought. And then we'll declare it source uh, re3.cc. And then we'll add our tests to And then we'll set compiler flags to this version we need later on. Yeah. 
Oh, I think these are actually preset list of Flag. Let's see. Okay. Basically, don't know what flags we need now, but. So we'll do, we'll set, so I think for now, we'll have a, so we'll have for now, Some kind of dubby method. I don't know. I'll just do the void for a row. Just for now. Just want to compile. Get that. Get, essentially get that pipeline working. So we can avoid a row. return nothing. But all it did was turn off hello. library. So I want to write um, we probably want to add the tests stuff into tests um, I believe tests will have so in third party we should have a CMakes list file here because we So here we want to do, what do we do here? Oh, yeah. Party list. Oh, very simple stuff. Let me just copy and why not. 
have it in our third party folder so we probably don't need it other than that. So in our third party, we have our CMAKES file in our third party folder. Now we want one here. Here, what did we do? We did tests. And we define our tests here. So we want to find First, define our three bases. Test. Test. You see, we want at. Oh, this is important. We want to link the Google Test Library to our RE three test target. Let's just create an R3, a simple RE3 test file. And then we can include a G test in there. I also want to include the interface for Google Test. gets usually stored. And then here we we'll test R3 tests to um, do nothing. Um, yeah. What's the macro to define any test? And here we'll just call we'll call our print hello method. Uh, we also need to define the mean function here, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. See. And then I 
Alright, so I think they'll set up. I think that sets up everything. So if we do tree shell two, we have our R3 include source here where the where the library itself is declared in C makes our list the school one. And our tests are declared here. We include that there. I think that should work. Okay, I think the loop we can do is we can make your build. C build C make the previous directory into this directory. Let's see if that works. generated it. So we're in the build directory. That always confuses me because it re it replicates the structure. The if you don't have been oh it should be in the test, I believe. RE3 test. It built lib RE32. So we can go. Right. So now we know this is. We know it's a shared library out there because it ends in SO. But it adds the lib in front of it. So we, can, we have to change that later. But we can go into. I believe we can go into test. It should be. RE3 test is great. So let's do test. Three test. Pass and just print it hello to do nothing. Great. Oh, got less up. That worked. Right, um, I'm going to push this as the initial commit, but I'm going to ignore this build directory because we don't want to include that. So, that. Modules. There would be get modules file. Um, we need to get ignore file. So I'll touch. Get ignore. It's a smaller file, so I just put in. I'll just put it through them. More. I build. That will work. Okay, ignore it. Um, so we change this to be committed. File test, G test. What's weird is this. Probably because we didn't properly so let's do get reset head test G test. Maybe this will work? Let's see. Okay. That did it, I think. So that adds the get modules. This adds the get ignore to ignore build C makes and everything. I think we just do get add dash. I'm not going to do it. dash a uh, get ignore get modules. Third party slash equal test. Let's make third source source tests and third party C. So I don't set um, the global user.email because I have a get accounts between uh, my school and my personal stuff. So I'm just going to um, No, I think I should be able to commit in nano. Project directory structure or building No working. Okay. Um, I think I can just exit and I'll 
Save modify buffer, yeah. That's a com uh, good commit message, yeah. Oh, okay. And then you can push it to RG Master. Oh, there you go. You can find the RE3 library here at my uh, GitHub slash RE3. You can uh, fork it, start and follow it, anything you want to do. This should just contain C, make uh, some basic C++ and C. Okay, so we got that project structure now. Um, hmm. So now, the first milestone on the design doc, so let's add to our stream log first. Project structure, and that solved. Check the sign doc. Look at that. Build for RED setup. That's set up. Um, I guess the design doc could be flushed out more. Yeah, so usage. The schedule. I think we can move the schedule to the top. So we got. So yeah, um, let's see what each. So we wanna. So I guess I'll add no, uh, to some other notes. So we have our notes. We're just gonna. We're just going to do some implementation planning here. So, or interface planning too. So we're going to do interface stuff. Implementation underneath. So for the interface, we likely want some kind of class for RE3. We want them to be able, this would be the interface to pre-compile it. Will we also want them to be able to compile it on the spot so that should mean we have a static uh, bool. static bool function to do re3 based um re3 based uh, matching so call full match and then this would take re3 or cause reference to an re3 object X and then the stream we right. We also want to have the same thing for a partial match. Uh, match. So our public interface should have a constructor which will take we shouldn't have a default constructor I don't really I don't really like that I think we should have in that case if we want to explicitly disallow a public constructor we can just say uh, equals delete that's C plus plus 11 feature it's super useful um, re3 so the so here we'll do, we'll pass in a const standard string to construct the regular expression. And then you can pass in a bool, a bunch of bool methods to... So here we'll pass full match, but instead of passing a regex object, we can just... Um, hmm. I don't really know why I'm doing this. This doesn't make sense. 
We shouldn't pass a regex object. That's just recompiling it. You might as well just pass it as a string. Let's see. Okay, do that. So here we're passing a string for the regex. A string for the regex. String. And it's string. Yeah. And here we'll have full match, partial match. And we'll also pass in strings. And I believe the incremental search should go here. But I don't think that's probably not its own function. Probably. And also, here we'll have constructors here. We'll have. Matching without catching. I guess that lines that's cool, but just simple matching here. Pass. Pass. And then here we're gonna have matching with catching. Now I think the best way to do this to have both versions, but instead of just passing a single argument, you can do so. Just passing the string that we want to match, we'll also pass in a variable number of uh, strings to do the uh, to capture the value of the matching. So we can uh, pass in. I'm not entirely sure to do variable arguments, so we'll just do variable args here. And we can replicate that down below here. Yeah. Here we go. Hmm. Partial match. Do incremental search. What would, it, what would it factor in if you want to do it to do any kind of thing? So what would that look like? So it should stop at... Oh, so it, oh, that's complicated. So with incremental search, this should probably be the case, but... So with the full match, it's pretty easy because you can... You'll just keep reading a string until you do a match. And then it should stop at that point. Have some kind of pointer um, to a string buffer, um, and then when you when you match the when you match the regular expression, it will stop, wait for you to do something, and then do the while loop. So in that case, and this this interface also probably needs to have a, a like match extraction too, or catching whatever we're doing. So, catching incremental search. So, an example of that would be if some string s equal to big message, and then we have a regex to match just the spaces, while We'll be what's an in so this we're just trying to decide the interface now. Um, what would uh, what would an intuitive interface be here? So we have the regular expression as a string. So so. We also likely want to pass that here, but that would recompile it. Actually, we'll work on that later. So here we have a, an RE3 object. R3, I'll just call it that. And what we want to do is incrementally do something, and then with the output, something is captured. So here, 
we want to do so R3 represents the regular expression, so we can do R3 dot. We want the RE3 object to give us the ability to do this incremental search. So what can we pass? Um, I guess we can just do incremental search of s and then pass in a variable a variable number of arguments for the output something with output the capture and I guess we can just do this what do you all think if you want if you think this inc uh, this interface is not that intuitive, let me know. I don't entirely know if this is the best choice, but we got to do this, so I'm just going to keep going. So, okay, search. Search. String. find some way of representing what we understand. Then we convert our understanding to an NFA. And then we want to convert NFA to DFA and reduce the DFA. These are kind of the three steps to compile it. This is simulation. Regex to a set of symbols that we understand. That will be okay. So, yeah. yeah, so we want so we want to con compile we want to construct this DFA, which will be represented as a table. We want the DFA to be able to do a certain set of things for us. Um restroom real quick so I'll be back in a bit. Let's take a small break. Just gotta use the restroom.
Make sure the stream is still working. All right, great. Okay. Thanks for y'all for being patient. Um, yeah, all right, let's get back to it. So yeah, we were determining implementation. Uh, so this, to compile, I think we should separate the object to represent the DFA from the actual executor of that DFA. I don't know if that meant it. So let's uh, hmm. so as a result of the constructor we should be able to construct a into a DFA which is essentially a table. So DFA should be we can we can install a DFA I think that's fine. And then what else? I don't think we would need to store the regular expression. We don't use that anywhere else. Oh it Oh yeah uh, another this is a this is a side topic but we do have to decide should we Allow copying and deciphering. Yeah. So we'll have a DFA. Then the DFA will provide. Do we need a separate object for this? Yeah, that makes it. So we're going to construct this as its own class because it will make. It will make testing a little bit easier. It will isolate those. But issue um, with that is, what if the DFA needs something here? Is that ever the case? If we were to implement this as a static function, right? Here, what do we have? We just pass the string as a regex. So what would this do? This would compile the regex. Would essentially, just be a static method that just calls regex so match pass on it. So we probably don't ever need huh. Yeah we probably need huh. I think if we have this DFA object it'll actually make the implementation of full match, partial match, just a question of implementing something in, uh, or calling something within DFA. Um, what would be better? So these, this is for catching. Because 
Because I think if we just had a DFA object, the interface between the two would actually just be the same. So I think we can just make this a table. We'll call it a table, right? A state table, which is just going to be using state table will just be a standard vector of standard vector of, I guess, strings to represent where to go after. Can we just use this? And we can treat the zeroth columns of these state table details. And treat the zeroth row and column as states in transitions, and then the table ij will equal some state to go to. So it'll always map to the state. Zeroth row will be transitions, zeroth column will be states. Hmm. Row is transitions, zeroth column are states that we can move to. Uh, tables. Table I through J will map to a state. It should actually just be the alphabet itself. Hmm. How do we represent an alphabet? That's complicated. What? Well, it's like that. And then the state table will come with. Full match. If we do a full match. We're going to read the entire string if at any point we don't accept. If there's no instance, if that string doesn't just match that regular expression, it should fail. If we do a partial match, if we at any point reach any accept state, we should return. Um, here, for catching... We'll worry about catching in a bit. So for this one, we have this constructed state table. We want to essentially define a method that almost like executes on this state table. So while we aren't in some kind of final state, we keep transitioning using the state to determine where we are and the alphabet to determine where to go. So is a two-dimensional table enough? <laughs> I think for now we can just say this will be okay. So we'll have the state table transition. I don't think we need anything else. The complicated portion of it will be in constructing the state table. And the other complicated portion will be will be full match, yes. And in catching. Yeah, so I guess this is we're not delete the separate decisions to be separate to Okay. These will just be essentially They'll both just construct the regular expression here. 
s ray x and just return r dot for match. Yeah, so these two I think are done. We've already implemented two functions. Wow, great. <laughs> um, yeah. So we have, I'm pretty sure this interface is good to go. Implementation though is gonna be a little bit more, obviously it's always the most complicated part. So we know how to compile a little bit. Now, if we want to, if we were to implement full match right now, what would it look like? So, I guess. So full match. Uh, full match should match the entire string. So we have, we're given a state table, and if we want to simulate, simulate the. Essentially, the the table or the computer that it represents. So while while we aren't the accept state, the accept state is what a finite state diagram ends on. So, like if you have a DFA, remember there were states and transitions between them. You'll only accept an input if you end up on that um, accept state at the end. Yeah, so here we're determining while we aren't on an accept state. No, that's not a, that's not a good that's not a good condition. Because you can you can keep reading past the end of it. Right? So you can have a substring that matches it. Okay, so for partial match we should have this condition instead. While we aren't on accept, keep reading, and then if it turns out that we can't transition, or yeah, so if it turns out we can't transition from a state, we should just return false. But in the case where we exit this while loop, immediately just return true. That's good enough. While we aren't on accept, keep reading. Keep reading here. Cruise on the string. condition is not the best one. So we gotta, because I'm not sure if this covers all the cases. Um, so if we have an empty string, um, we'll keep, well, we can't read anything. If we can't transition, we can't transition from a thing you'll return false. Single character. So the moment we accept something, we should return true, which is what this says. The moment, so when we aren't accepting something, we keep reading. And then, and then if there's any, at any point if we can't move on, we return false. So we'll have that now. So why, but for full match, because we want to read up to the end of the string, we're going to read the entire string. Uh, so while trying the string, very Pythonic. Um, so while trying the string, we're gonna keep reading each character. Uh, increment FSM execution. 
And then what should we do here? If we can't increment return false. We should remember where we are. So we'll have a increment position table here and then we'll check in the end if position of the table is accept return true return true else return false and we'll initialize position in table So that's for partial match, that's for full match. We regex constructor will, will determine that. Um, so for catching, so for catching, catching. So we what we can do here is we can have a single function. You know, that'll be slow. Wait. Um, so we wanna if we match. If something matches our regular expression, we want it to return, right? Um, matches our regular expression, we want it to return. So for an example, that would be, say we're trying to match digits, any number of them. So this should, uh, should match it and then return it. So what can we do? We can, um, I think we're going to take what we have here and just change it a little bit. I think I should do the trick. So here, implement catching. We have a variable number of string arguments that follows what we're trying to catch. So we can... So we can keep track. Construct string. Actually, they give us a string, so actually, no, we should we should build up our own string. So I'm going to do string catch, and then while while we can increment the position properly, append to catch string. If we end up in accept, return true. We actually we probably also want to do uh, arg they gave us equal to catch so that we know what what we caught. Append, append the character red to the char screen. Else we can return false. I think we can use the same process here. what this is what if they give us four things to catch in a regular expression for partial match that's complicated because with full match it's like it's an all or nothing kind of situation So this is pretty tough. Um, okay, so this will construct the constructs the state table.
Actually, I don't even think this, this catching wall works here either. So an example of what I'm trying to do is, say we have, so we have a string. So I'll have a string here. Let's do. So let's just have a bunch of numbers, right? We have 10, we have 10.0, we have 11.2, and then we have 12, and then we have 10, 12 point three, two. I mean, and we just want to match those that are our doubles. So if you want to match a double, we're going to do 0 through 9, is the numbers and then another zero through nine, right? And then we want to capture each one. So we'll be capturing these. So if we were just doing a full match, this would return false. Not capture anything. Let's just let's let's move this example down. So here it, it should just match 10.0, nothing else, because that's the first match and we're not doing an incremental search. Um, yet. So if we wanted to just match the double, we wanted to capture the double. Right, so we have a state diagram for this right here to match a double. And it'll read one, it'll read zero, it'll detect there's a stop. That's good. Read zero. Oh, these need to be so with regular expressions you can specify pretty sure you can specify this plus, which says it must be one or more. Uh zero or nine. The, that way we don't have something like ten point something that just doesn't make sense. Um, so yeah. So now we're trying to capture this. Zero. We can build up a, a, a string for every character that we read that matches it. And then in the case where it does properly match it, right, we'll be in the accept state at some point here, and then we'll read the space and then we won't. So when we're here, we accept. In that case, we set the capture. And then, oh, what if, okay. So the complicated situation now, that, that handles that single one. What if they wanted to match two? Plus, plus, plus. So if they wanted to match two, it would be a space. Okay, so if we wanted to tell them, so if we wanted them to specifically match to, we would have them have digit space digit. These are classes uh, we can use for capturing. So what we can do is if we, we can remember in our state table where we should start capturing. So I guess we can store Can have a vector of characters? No, it's not that good. Um, it's tricky. So if we wanted to get, so let's just let's just do this. So say we wanted to capture two digits. Here D means digits. If we wanted to capture two digits, what would what state would we have to track? That's kind of what I'm trying to get at. So, 
We're reading each character one by one, and that will help trans push the transition table one position at a time. Right? We read this space. There's no dots, so the transition table will reset. We read one, zero. Transition table moves from one to zero. It reads the dot. Continue. It reads the zero. And then read the space. Uh, so if it reads the zero, and then it reads the space, it will match. So we gotta remember where we were. Okay. So now that we've matched, say we remember where we were. Should we remember the beginning and the end of the match? Within the string. Oh. Then. Some notes. We can remember matches. And then from there we can decide. Hey, do we, if we match this digit, we remember where this was. If it mat, hmm. in that case, we can then cast it properly. Cast it to a string properly. Yeah, to the string, and then we can say, in, but what if they pass a double? They want to capture a double. Cast the string, cast the string properly. So if they pass a double as an argument, a string as an argument after. If we implement a full match, then why do we, why would this interface even need um, to catch things, right? Because in the case where if it, it's a full match, the entire string matches what you're trying to do. So why, oh no, there's still a case for that. Because if it's a full match, you might want to extract the values from it. So we should have that there. Back to catching later. It's kind of a, it's blocking us now, so we can just do uh, combined catching. And I'll um, also store in the, in the dock that we haven't yet caught catching. essentially doing a partial match essentially doing a partial match of or we're rather we're doing a full match of a substring 
Alright. So, what's an example of incompatible switch? So it should read each character until until an accept. So while we are not in accept, actually, the first condition should be while we are not at the end of the string. So while we are reading characters, there are the choice to read. So we're reading each character, and we want to stop when we found something. And while match has not occurred, occurred we increment increment the state table and transition. We, let's just use what we use the trend we used before, so increment finding state machine execution. So in the case where or well it matches should this be an and or an or? Our choice to read. where it matches a um, nested while loops are kind of nasty. I don't want to do that. But um, here. No, let's just let's just do it. This will be pretty nasty. But we do a while we are reading characters, and then while uh, we aren't set. And in the case where we can't transition, we know we're done. So we can just. times where an incremental search will get used is when uh, when they want to capture the value of the output so we have to have to think about that first so we can set up catching return or rather set strings and then if oh so in the case Essentially, we'll spot the details later. Or rather, if it does, um, so we gotta remember where we are between each iteration. So I guess that should be state for RE3. So we can add that as a member variable here. So we can have um, so for 
for trying to remember where we are in some string. Hmm. So if someone passes in a string, we have to remember where we are within that string's position. But then if they recall it, recall that string elsewhere. So I guess we can just remember the address of the last place we were at. Um, how do we do that? We can do a sharp pointer. That doesn't work well with string. Which one's more interchangeable? I guess we can just remember index where we were. Now, if we just remember the index, what we can do is we can just take the beginning of the chart pointer and add that index, casting it size one so it's just like n chars. Um, and then if we remember the index, we can just increment the string iterator. That way it works with both the interfaces. So I guess we can ret uh, remember SST. Last. Um, hmm. Last match. String position. Here we actually want to return. So here, if we are, if we're at the end of the string, we want to return false. Just like that. Right. Char we're reading, and then else we return true. So we don't want it to continue past. So this catching thing is real, real meaty problem that we don't know about yet. I'll look into it. Or if you all have suggestions on how we can implement it, comment on the design doc. Let me know what you think. Wait. Okay. All right. So we have right now we have an interface. We have the basics of the implementation we want. Uh, now. Now I'm gonna see. I'm gonna revise our our like design doc plan. So here we have this. Schedule said this. Extract matching will be the hardest part. So we might, but the rest I think should be okay. So we can maybe, since it's at the end, we can put that off till later. For now, We'll, for in the short term, I'll prioritize the constructor itself. Yeah. So this itself might take a little bit longer too, because if we construct, we are constructing the table, but we haven't run the executor yet. So we gotta add. State table. State table. So one, we should be implementing those two. We should also have an implementation for our state table execute. Yeah, that's going to be super important towards getting all of these working. Yeah. Okay.
right, so um, so tomorrow we're going to focus on actually understanding the Perl regular expression syntax and starting to plan and actually start writing the um, the actual like token tokenizing of a, a regular expression. So that will be tomorrow. Yeah, that'll be tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I think we got a decent amount done today. We have every we have an interface. We have an implementation. We have to think about a lot of these details, though, like catching. I'm not entirely sure how we're going to do that yet. I'm going to try and think about it. Um, if you all have tips on how we can implement catching, add them to this design doc. You can find the design doc at the bottom of my Twitch page. So there should be a section under projects that includes uh, previous. It should actually include this stream log of work we do here and also the design docs for projects we want. If you want to fork this and keep following this project, uh, come to the RE3 library for follow, watch, whatever you want to do. And yeah, I think tomorrow we can get to actually doing more important things and just setting up build. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for joining me tonight, and I'll see you tomorrow.